Yo, what's going on, Akuo? So glad to be part of your routine again. Thank you for letting us invade your phones, your, your tablets, your computers, your TVs, and whatever room it is that you are watching from, whether it's your bedroom, your kitchen, your living room, it doesn't matter. God's presence is there with you. If you're new here, my name is Abel. I'm the worship leader here at Akuo Church, and I just want to invite us into a time of worship where we're going to sing together, sing a song, and, and just really remember just how good, he's it, how good he is. So let's go ahead and sing out. Come on, help me out. I search the world. Oh, I search the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise Treasures of faith Are never enough Then you came along And you put me back together Desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Come on, there's nothing better than him. He's the good God that loves us for who we are, despite our flaws and our weaknesses. So we won't be afraid to show him every single part of our lives. Come on, let's sing this out. So I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. Every failure and flaw Lord, you've seen them all and you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley He always is There's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, oh that out again there's nothing better oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you oh, he turns our morning into dancing Turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Come on, graves into gardens. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the
Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing. To gardens, you turn bones into armies, you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens, you turn bones into armies. Turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. He's the only God who can. He's the only God that is so graceful with us. It's incredible, it's amazing. The only God who can break the power that binds us. Let's sing this out. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? And so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free I sing for all that you've done for me. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Come on, this is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for that you've done for me all that you've done for me come on let's sing his praises because he is worthy there's no other king like him no other king like Jesus what other king leaves his throne 
What other king leaves his throne? What other king leaves his glory? What other king leaves his glory to die? His glory to die. You are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. Our adoration belongs to you. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy. Worthy, worthy, oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life that I would be. Set free, oh Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. a song that we sing out to you, that you alone are worthy of all of our praise. There's nothing in this world that can ever outshine you, Jesus. So the best that we know how, we lay down our lives in worship. We lay down everything we are at your feet. Jesus, and I just pray that you would speak to us today every single person watching, every family represented here. Speak to us. So we thank you in advance and we praise you in advance for all the good things that you are about to do. We pray all these things in your mighty, glorious name, in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. You guys, enjoy the rest of the service. So I'm so happy to be with you for joining us here on week three of our series called I Don't Wanna Go. To get this series started, to get to this series this year, it's been a bit of a process. It started with us learning about spiritual fruit and we learned that it comes directly from the Holy Spirit. Then we learned what kind of spiritual fruit can actually be born through us. And those fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, most recently, we saw that the crappy situation in our lives can be used to fertilize this fruit. So once we got all of this stuff done, then God will start asking us to use that fruit somewhere. Now, in this series, we found out that when things are going crazy, that God's word is greater than the world's fire, and that when the fires of this world are raging around us, we need to stand still and watch for the Lord before we start moving. And even when we know both of these truths, we can still find ourselves looking at God when he's asking us to do something and saying, I don't wanna go. Now to be totally honest, open and transparent with you, I have done this a lot and actually very recently. Uh, it, it, I actually had one just happen a few weeks ago. 
I had gone to make a hospital visit for one of our church members, and it's in a hospital that had a lot, a lot of construction going on, and uh, things uh, like that are just like normal. So I, I, you know, I just kept on pressing on, and I walked from the parking lot into the building and to what I thought was the correct place. But when I got to the main part of the building, I realized that I didn't really know where I was going. Then I asked someone that worked there, like, to where I would go to get to the correct tower. Now I'm sure they gave me very coherent and well detailed instructions, but here's how I heard it. They were like, leave this room, through the door on the left, then when you get out, take a right, walk for a while, take another right, then take a left, followed by a right, by a left. Don't take that next left, but actually go right, then left, then right, left, B, A, B, A, then press start. Now I was trying to get to this person's room, not enter a code in for Contra on the Nintendo. You know what I'm saying? So I finally made my way over and eventually found myself in the correct elevator heading to the correct floor. When I got off the elevator, I came into like a small room and in it, there were two vending machines and there was a chair to my right with a woman sitting in it. She was probably older than my parents but younger than my grandparents and she was on the phone with someone. And while she was on the phone, I could just see like the exhaustion, worry and frustration just, just all over her face. And when I saw her, I very clearly heard from God. He wanted me to go and pray with her. So what did I say? I don't wanna go. I was like, but Lord, I'm here to go and talk with this other person over there. This is what I was created for. This is what you called me to do, to go be a pastor for those people that come to the church that you called them to. I'm gonna go with that other person. And he answered me with, go and pray with her. And I was like, Lord, I gotta go with this other person over here. I don't wanna go. If you want me to pray with her, make sure she's still here when I get done with this visit, and then I'll go pray with her. So I went in, chatted, made my visit, prayed. It was a pretty normal hospital visit. I was happy to sit and talk and pray with someone that I knew and someone that goes to our church. It was all good. Then I start to make my way out to the elevators. And guess what? That woman is still there. So when I saw her, guess what I did? I like from far away, I just like tried to make some eye contact with her. And I was like, Lord, if you want her to talk with me, then have her look up at me. And she wouldn't. And I was like, well, I tried. And then I walked to the elevator and I pushed the button and I'm standing there and I'm just like feeling God, right? God's pushing on me to pray with her. And that's when the doors to the elevator opened and I was going to have to make a decision. Get on the elevator to go home and get some work done for this church or turn around and go pray with a woman that wasn't a part of my plan or the things I was messing with up to that point. Have you ever found yourself in the middle of a situation like this? Have you ever been doing what you thought was the right thing, but then something comes along that is like more right than what you were doing? Have you ever started on a project that is good and will give God glory, but then you get called out of it to do something else? I think a lot of us have. So how do we decipher the difference between the right thing and like the more right thing? The writer thing? <laughs> I, I guess an easier way to say it is that we don't just, we don't wanna do just the right thing, we wanna do the right thing at the right time. Do we think it's good when we, or do what we think is good when we wanna do is fine, right? Like that's fine. But going to the right place at the right time, doing the right thing at the right time, that is God's will. That's what we're called to do. So timing is so important in this whole thing. Saying, I don't wanna go, is just as wrong as going to the place we think we're supposed to be and doing what we think is right instead of what God's called us to do. It's something that a lot of us have done in our own lives and it's something we see happen with some people in the Bible. Now today, one of the people I want to talk about is Esther. Now Esther uh, was an Israelite woman, a Jewish woman, an orphan from the Israelite family of Benjamin. She lived with the Jewish exiles in Persia, you know, under captivity. They were ruled without a land of their own and oppressed by the Persians. She was raised by her cousin Mordecai, a minor government official and covert leader of the Jewish community in the capital of the Persian kingdom. The ruler of this land uh, while Esther is there, is named King Xerxes. And he was in charge of Persia with his, king, with his queen, Vashiti, by his side. Now one day, Xerxes had her gone, banished, because she refused 
to go and sit with him in the court. So Xerxes made this decree that Vashidi would no longer be her, his queen. Now, by the way, this is a super bad look for my dude Xerxes, right? Just have a conversation with your queen. Maybe she was tired of something. Don't just banish her from the kingdom. No matter what, he's the king and what he says goes. So a nationwide search was open to find the next queen. And wouldn't you know it, Esther was chosen to be the next queen. However, she was able to do this by listening to her cousin Mordecai's wise advice to conceal her nationality and heritage because the Israelites were thought of as a second-class citizen in that nation at that time. And things are going well for Esther. They got even better because Mordecai discovered a plot to kill the king, and Esther rushed to Xerxes to tell him all about it. The king was incredibly grateful to her and Mordecai because of this. Well, one day Mordecai crossed the number two official in the entire nation. And when that happened, that dude was not happy. So he decided that he would not only sentence Mordecai to death, but he would sentence the entire Israelite race to death as well. So when Mordecai learns this plan, he runs to Esther to try and help convince her to help the people. But that isn't an easy task for Esther to accomplish. So let's take a look at her reaction here in chapter four of the book of Esther. There it says, all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. So Esther is worried. She doesn't know what to really do. Esther knows that if she just walks into the king's court, she could be killed. Esther's like, I'm here in the palace. God took me from like an orphan, to, an orphan girl to become the queen of Persia. I have lived out the purpose he had for me. I have done the work that needed to be done. I don't want to go in there. But Mordecai can't allow this to happen. He knows an entire nation hangs in the balance and Esther is their only real hope. So Mordecai replies with this. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Mordecai knows that if the Israelites, that if the Jews are allowed to be murdered through genocide, if these Persians officials ever find out that Esther is also Jewish, they would kill her as well. So he pleads with her and ends with this line. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Think about that. Esther was definitely feeling like she had already had more accomplished in her life than she ever could dream. She was happy to continue to live in the blessing that God had already given her. However, that wasn't her purpose. She wasn't just supposed to be the queen. She was supposed to be a straight up savior to her people. She was created to lay her life on the line for her family, for her people. So with great bravery, Esther stepped before the king and asked for him to spare the Jews living in his nation. The king very graciously agreed to do whatever she asked of him and killed the men that were leading the charge for this genocide. From that day on, people of Jewish faith will celebrate this holiday every single year. So what we see here is that even though God had brought Esther into an amazing spot, he had so much fruit that she, he had brought into her life that, that wasn't what he necessarily was calling her to do. He wanted her to do more than just be the queen. He wanted her to be the one that would save his people. So even though she was doing good things, it wasn't the God thing, which is our transforming truth for today. Remember, each week I want you to take a lie out of your mind and replace it with the truth. So remember, doing good things isn't necessarily what we are called to do. I mean, yes, they're good. But a good thing doesn't mean that for sure it's a God thing. So look at it like this. I could be sitting and reading my Bible at my house. That's a good thing, right? I think we can all agree on that. It could also be something that God called me to do. It could be a God thing. However, if I were reading my Bible and someone came knocking at my door and needed help and was just dying for help, and if I helped that person, they would be able to see how much God cares for them through that act of kindness. But instead of answering my door, I just kept on reading my Bible. In that situation, which one is the good thing and which one is the God thing? 
What if I was put in that place for such a time as that? A time to help my fellow man instead of just reading my Bible. I think we would say opening the door would be the God thing, right? So that brings me to this transforming truth for today, for this week. God's timing is better than good timing. God's timing is better than good timing. We wanna lean into the timing that God has created for us. We need to be people that are willing to listen to God even when we have planned out our whole day. We need to be people that use the fruits that the Holy Spirit has grown in us on God's time and not just good time. Think about it like this. Doing something good at a good time will be good, sure, great. But doing God's thing in God's time, that will be perfect. So would you rather do the good thing or the perfect thing? So right now, type that into the chat. Type in God's timing is better than good timing. And if you aren't able to type anything in right now, just say that truth out loud. God's timing is better than good timing. And I wanna show you another instance of this at work. For this, we will actually go to the time of Jesus' ministry. And in, in this story, he's actually right at the start of it. He's starting to gain some of his notoriety. And during this story recorded by the disciple Luke, Jesus is preaching by the side of the sea. And the crowd starts to grow bigger and bigger, he, and he can't really connect with all of them. So he asks a man named Simon if he can borrow one of his boats to finish the rest of his preaching in the boat. Simon says yes, and Jesus gets on the boat and goes a short distance from the store, from the shore. It's from his boat that Jesus finishes up preaching to the crowd. And here's where it gets interesting. Here is what Luke's account says about Jesus here. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. So I'll stop right there. Jesus is telling Simon to go out and catch some fish. Now remember, Simon is a fisherman that doesn't just do this for fun. He does this for a business. Also, I would imagine Simon's pretty good because he has multiple boats that he owns that are sitting right there on the water. So if Simon said that he worked hard the night before trying to catch fish and this expert fisherman and his crew couldn't catch anything, it's a good bet that there isn't anything out there for Simon. On top of that, Simon had already done a good thing for Jesus. He let this rabbi go out and use his boat to do his talk. Simon had done all the good work he needed to do. He fish the way he was supposed to in the time he thought he was supposed to, and then he helped the rabbi out. He's good, right? If it were me, I'd probably say no. I'd try to find a reason to get out of this thing that God has asked me to do. But look at how Simon responds to Jesus. There he says, but if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. There are so many things to look at here. First off, look at how Simon responds. He's basically like, I know there are no fish in the water. I know that this isn't the right time for me to be catching fish and I know that they won't be right over there. But Jesus, if that's what you are asking me to do, I'll do it. Then when Simon listens to what Jesus has told him to do, which is literally what Simon had done the entire night before, Simon's net is totally full. Remember the night before Simon had gone out and done the good thing. He worked hard trying to catch some fish to sell so he could provide for his family and his crew, but nothing happened. Then when he does the exact same thing in the timing that Jesus has, it couldn't have been a more different outcome because not only did they catch some fish, but they caught so many fish that their nets started to tear. They caught so many fish, Simon had to call another boat over to come and help. They caught so many fish that the other boat that came to help couldn't even bear the weight. They both started to sink. Guys, that's the difference between good things and God things. That's the difference between good timing and God's timing. What we can do with good is a joke when it's compared to what we can do with God. The blessings that are received when we are on God's timing is amazing. When we can realize that we are not only called to go somewhere, 
but we were called to do it in a certain time, that's when everything changes. So for us, we have to do the God stuff. We can't just do the good things. There's nothing wrong with the good things. They just aren't God things. So let me take you back to my story there in the hospital, right? There I am with this decision to make. I don't really want to pray with this woman. I just got done praying. I mean, what if she thinks I'm weird or, or crazy or a creeper? And like I said, I just did the good thing. I just did a hospital visit. I should be good to go. As I'm thinking all of this, I can just feel God like leaning on me, like pushing me to go and talk to this woman. So I finally listen, I turn around, I look at her, I walk over and I say, excuse me, ma'am, are you a praying woman? And that's when she looks at me and lights up and it turns out she is a praying woman. She was just having a hard time because she was woken up by a phone call in the middle of the night. It was the nurse telling her that her husband was having some complications. So this woman got up to go to the hospital and had been sitting in this empty elevator room for three hours before I'd walked in there to talk to her. She proceeded to tell me how her and her husband were very faithful people and she'd been waiting for God to send her something to encourage her during this time. We actually talked for a, a while. I got to know where she was from, what church she was all about, and, and the part of the Bible that her and her, her Bible study had been going through. The time I spent with her was almost as long as my first visit of the day in the actual hospital room. At the end, we began to pray, and I felt like I had to pray something specific. I prayed that while she was in there, people would be able to see God through her and her husband. I prayed that people would wonder how she was taking things so well and it would be through that posture that she held that she would be able to share the gospel with them. So while I'm in the middle of this prayer, like her eyes closed praying, she stops, looks up at me and said, that's exactly what I've been praying about this entire time we've been here. Exactly the words I've been praying. And she was happy and overjoyed that God had sent her encouragement in a way that only she would fully understand. This was how God told me that day for me to cast my nets onto the other side. This was how I learned that I had been created for a day such as that. It's a day that I was taught once again that God's timing is better than good timing. Akuo, if God can use me, he can use you. I'm someone that will tell him no all the time, right? Like, I tell you these stories. I'm someone that will fall short regularly, but he still allows me to be on these amazing adventures with him. And you can do these things too. The same Holy Spirit that works within me will work within you. My title doesn't give me special stuff. My title doesn't give me upgraded abilities. All these stories of hearing from God and moving in the direction he asked can be done by you too. Let's actually go back to the story of Simon the fisherman to see how this plays out and how it connects with what we're talking about right now. There it says, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, oh Lord, please save me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Guys, look at this. Simon looked at Jesus and knew he didn't measure up. So he fell to his knees to proclaim that he was a sinful man that didn't deserve to be in the presence of God. Simon knew all the things he had done in his life weren't even good, much less on the level of perfection that God is on. But look at the way Jesus replies this. He says, don't be afraid. Jesus comforts Simon in this moment. Jesus lets them know that everything is okay. Then Simon gets an upgrade. Jesus says, from now on, you will be fishing for people. And Simon and some of his crew go on to follow Jesus and become disciples of Jesus right there. Now, just to be clear, Simon wasn't chosen, chosen to go and follow Jesus because of how smart and well-read he was. Simon wasn't chosen because he was without sin. Simon wasn't even chosen because he was a great fisherman. Simon was chosen because, Simon was chosen by Jesus because of one reason alone. Simon listened. 
When Jesus told Simon to do something, he did it. It was because of obedience. It was because Simon understood that God's timing is better than good timing, that he became one of the disciples. It was because of Simon's ability to follow through on what Jesus said that he was blessed with more. Simon caught a ton of fish, sure, I bet that was awesome. But then he got to follow Jesus and be a fisher of men. However, the real blessing that Simon got from Jesus was a name. Jesus eventually changed Simon's name and started calling him Peter because Peter was going to be the rock that the entire church was built upon. Jesus was ready to trust his entire earthly ministry to Peter, not because he was awesome, but because he listened. And we can do the same thing, guys. We can listen to how Jesus is calling us in our lives. And if we can do that, I guarantee you that you will see so many extra blessings in your lives. You will get so many, you can't contain them. You will get this fruit growing in your life in such an abundant way that you will have no other choice than to share it with the people around you. And that's the other half of what listening to Jesus is about. So yes, part of the gospel is about believing in Jesus and through that he forgives our sins. And through that, we get into heaven. That's great and that's awesome and I want that for each and every one of you. But the other part of the gospel is about us listening to Jesus, allowing the Holy Spirit to direct us in our lives and becoming the intersection of heaven and earth in this world. So when you follow Jesus, that's who you are. You are the one that can bring heaven and all of its glory to your friends, to your family, to your job, to your neighborhood, and to your city. The gospel of Jesus isn't just about getting us into heaven. It's about so much more. And this might be your time. This might be your day. You may have been made for a time such as this. Today may be the day that you listen to Jesus and start your relationship with him. To do that, it's really simple. All you have to do is have a simple conversation with Jesus, which we would just call a prayer. Then you just let Jesus know that you believe in him and what he did here on this earth for you in the best way you possibly can. Now to help you out, I'd like to ask everyone in the Kuo community to pray along with you. Because here at Akuo, no one ever has to pray alone. There's always a community here for you. So if you wanna start listening to Jesus today, just now, just bow your head and pray something like this along with me. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for meeting me right on time. I know that I don't know you very well, and I know that I have messed up a bunch, but I'd like to change that today. So today I say that I believe in you. I believe in everything you did for me. Jesus, right here, right now, I ask for you to start speaking into my life. Thank you for your patience with me. Thank you for sticking around when I've run as far away from you as possible. Amen. Now let's keep our heads bowed. And Now if you're a believer, whether it's been for five decades or the last five seconds and you want things, you want to see things change in your life, I want you to pray something along with me. Just pray something like this. Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your awesomeness. Thank you for your timing, Jesus. Today I come to you to ask you for better hearing. I ask that you would allow me to hear you better when you ask me to move. Today, I come to you to ask for better vision, to see better. I ask that you would allow me to see your timing in my life. Jesus, let me hear and see your will in a very re real and tangible way. Help me understand how perfect your timing is. Thank you for everything, Lord. Thank you so much for everything you do. And we pray all of these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, guys. Well, thank you for spending this time with us today. I have a few things to share with you before we go. The first thing I want to talk about is what we have going on next week. So next week, we're going to continue in this series, I Don't Want to Go. And what we'll be talking about next week is the greatest and most famous instance of not wanting to go with what God wants to do. 
It's going to be a very good one, and I can't wait to spend that time with you guys. So be sure and watch along with us next week at 8.30 and 10 o'clock to find out more. And feel free to share the links and, and, and just share this with someone, uh, this message if you know someone that needs to hear this. The next thing I want to talk about is how we practice generosity here at Akuo. What we do is practice the biblical me method of giving called tithing, which means giving a first fruit 10% offering to the storehouse, which is your local church. Now we know that when you trust God with your finances, there's a great blessing. Now I'm not saying that you are gonna get like this crazy, amazing like video camera or you know new phone like the iPhone 17 or something like that because you start tithing. That's not how it works. But what does happen is that anytime that you trust God with anything, you get a blessing in it, right? Anytime you move where God wants you to move, there's blessing there. And we want you to experience that blessing. So this is a very practical way that you can do that by just tithing here to Kuo. Now, some of you might not have that possibility. You might not be able to tithe right now. For that, if things are tough for you and your family, we wanna be here for you. We wanna be linked to you during this time. So if you need anything at all, please reach out to us. Or if you know someone that needs some help, please let us know. To do that, all you have to do is go to our website, akuo.church, and click on the Contact Us link. And you can also send me an email directly at humby.cervera at akuo.church. Now you can call or text the church directly at 210-901-8785 to reach out to us in that way. Now if you're willing to tithe here at Akuo Church, the way you can do that is by going to our website, akuo.church. When you get there, all you have to do is click on the giving link and follow the instructions. We also have our text to tithe option. For that, all you have to do is text AKUO, A-K-O-U-O, and the dollar amount you want to tithe to the number 77977. If you don't want to give electronically, we also have our PO Box available if you'd like to send your tithe through a check. For that, all you have to do is mail your tithe to PO Box 125, San Antonio, Texas, 78201. Next, I just want to remind you guys about our Zoom group. This is a great way for us to get together and hear how God is bearing fruit in us and how we can share it with one another. This is also a place where we can get together and just really build a good community. This could also be a place where you find like your next group of friends. So we want you to join us this Wednesday night at 7.30. For all the links to the Zoom group, all you have to do is go to any of our social media pages. Now, in addition to the Zoom group, we have our first in-person group meeting here in the Monticello Park neighborhood every single Monday night. It's taking place outside, and as of now, everyone is wearing a mask for the time being. Now, if you're interested in being a part of it, we'll be posting stuff about it every single chance that we get. Okay, guys, that's all that we have for you today. As always, I want you to know that I love you all, and I'm praying for you, each and every one of you, all week long. So let me pray over you one last time before we go. So, Father, I, I just ask that as people uh, turn off their phones, click off their TV, turn off their browsers, and just put everything away and, and, and finish up with this, this message, I ask that you would be with them. I ask that you would continue to speak to them, Lord. And I pray that they would hear you. I pray that they would hear you in how you want them to move and when you want them to move, Lord. I pray that you would just make it so clear for them that they couldn't do anything but listen to your will. We thank you for everything, Lord. We love you. And we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, that's all that we have for you. You have a great week. Thank you.